special thanks to all of our panelists for joining us. Um, for those of you that I don't know, my name is Brian Finelli, and I work in the Lindner Career Services Office, specifically with marketing students. The other career coaches for marketing are here as well, Carly from Boley, and then Jess Lee, who works with our master's students. Um, but we are really excited to have this conversation with uh, local social media marketers who are also affiliated with the University of Cincinnati. So want to go ahead and turn it over to them and give each of them the opportunity to introduce themselves. And we'll start, we'll go in alphabetical order, just like this slide. I'm going to stop sharing this so that we can see all of you full screen. Uh, but we'll go ahead and start with you, Suzanne. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Suzanne Bizek. Um, I definitely recognize some student names on here. And um, yeah, for those who uh, don't know me or might not have seen me around Linder Hall before, I am the Assistant Director of Marketing and Communications, um, specifically for the Linder College of Business at UC. So um, Brian and, Ca and Carly are my colleagues, and it's kind of fun to nerd out about marketing stuff with them every so often. But um, basically, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a, a lean team. Um, it's just me, but I collaborate with a lot of people throughout the college and also throughout UC for anything from supporting our undergraduate and graduate admissions, recruitment and yield cycles um, to um, supporting our alumni events some donor events. Um, the college has lots of centers that have events and different news items that um, that need promoting. So, um, and oh, and also our website making web updates, all all those kinds of things. Um, but I'm also behind the social media channels at Linner too. So, um, really excited to talk about social media with everyone else today. Awesome! Thank you so much for being here, Suzanne. We'll go ahead and jump to Allie. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Allie Carley. I am a social media specialist at Empower Media Marketing. Um, our offices, back when we could go there, we're are down in OTR. So we're a local agency that has been around for um, almost 30 years in Cincinnati, which is awesome. I've been there about a year and a half and um, also went to UC, but I was in communication over at McMicken. So sorry, not really a part of Lindner, but we'll just keep that to ourselves, will we? Um, <laughs> so yeah, I work on a bunch of big brands, paid social media strategies um, primarily. So not necessarily the content creation or the community management or organic side of social, but really that paid side um, on the back end of platforms. Um, for a bunch of big brands. So I'm excited to talk more and learn learn whatever you guys or answer whatever you guys want to learn about. So phenomenal. Thank you so much, Allie. Courtney, we'll go ahead and jump to you. Had to make sure I was unmuted. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So my name is Courtney Henderson. I um graduated from Lindner in 2017. I started at so I actually it's I'm back at Ahology now. I actually, my first co-op was at Ahology when they were a startup and doing um, specifically working on Pinterest as a platform. And so they've since brought in their horizon to um, all of the social media platforms. And so I, we exclusively work with paid media as well. And uh, we're located also in OTR uh, back when we were still able to be in the office. And so, yeah, I started um, back at Ahology in uh, January of this year. So um, I've only been on for eight or seven months, almost eight months, but it feels like years at this point. I feel like it's been a really long eight months, uh, which is a great thing. I've learned so much um, from a social media perspective. Um, I basically am a social media manager and um, do all of the optimizing for paid media as well as um, getting everything uploaded uh, for those platforms. What is uh, unique about what we do is that we partner with a lot of um, influencers to create content that's very um, uh, friendly to the platform experience. So um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of interesting work there. Awesome, thank you for being here, Courtney. Amy, we'll jump to you. Hi, 
everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Mersh. Um, I am by day uh, a marketing manager at ProSource, um, which is a local B2B technology company. Um, so kind of like Suzanne talked about, um, I manage our entire marketing communications landscape. Um, so everything from all of our digital, all of our website stuff, everything that's not digital as well, um, support a sales team. Um, and then a big part of my role is um, our social media as well. Um, and then the other kind of the other reason that I'm here talking to you guys um, is I am the VP of Marketing Communications for uh, the Cincinnati chapter of the American Marketing Association. So uh, apparently decided I like this stuff enough to volunteer to do it in my free time. Um, Suzanne and I laugh sometimes about how like this world is just really like it's really like a lifestyle. So um, you got it. You got to kind of love it because you're you're in it all the time. Um, I uh, I got my master's from UC and actually my first job out of college was at the UC College of Business. Um, so thrilled to thrilled to uh, be able to participate in these things. But I really like my two kind of roles because, um, you know, a B2B um, social media is is really different than, you know, the kind of comms that a typical B2C organization would do, or even the kind of comms that I do for um, the American Marketing Association, where you're really trying to reach directly out to members and guests and members of the community. Um, so I think that um, one of the reasons I love my role is because I get to have hands on all of it. So I get to really see how um, social media weaves into the rest of our marketing strategy. Um, get to have to when you're the only person on your team it all falls on you either way um but i think that for me that's an incredibly valuable getting to see how it fits into the whole landscape so really excited to talk to you guys thank you so much amy i didn't realize that you started at Lindner. that's that's awesome it was um, right before you guys became Lindner. i was Lindner. there I was for like a minute okay the took out but when when we decided to call it Lindner, um, then, <laughs> gotcha. uh, then I moved on. But. Good deal. Uh, thanks so much for being here, Amy. And then last but not least, Morgan. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Morgan, and I am a social media manager at Crossroads Church. So we are um, technically have 12 locations um, across kind of the tri-state area, but mostly based in Oakley right there, um, not too far from the UC campus. Um, so I've actually just started there in March. My first day was when everybody went to work from home. Um, so it's been a really unique experience for a lot of different reasons. Um, when, you know, as a church, you rely on that in-building experience. And so we're totally digital now. Um, which is just brings a lot of complexities to the social world. Um, but specifically, my role is to support all of our um, 12 sites, 13, including our online community um, on their social platforms. Nominal. Thank you so much for being here, Morgan. Um, okay, so thank you all for introducing yourselves, students. Um, like I mentioned before, I know some of you have joined since the beginning of this call, feel free to enter any questions that you have into the chat as we have our conversation today, and we will try to get all of your questions about social media marketing answered. So if you think of anything, feel free to pop that in the chat. Um, to get the conversation started, I know that social media marketing there are many misconceptions about what that actually looks like because i'm sure for a lot of people you know that you think it's it's influencing people it's it's creating cool designs it's you know things that are typically associated with um you know posting things on instagram but i'm wondering if some of you can talk about misconceptions that are common in the field and um you know maybe addressing some of those misconceptions so does anything come to mind for all of you as we think about like misconceptions when it comes to social media marketing. Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, I think one of the biggest mis misconceptions and especially one that I had coming from, I have a background uh, in doing branding for a CPG here in Cincinnati. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions for me was that social media was, you know, on the rise for, for a lot of reasons. And I think, in reality, it's like social media is here when it comes to advertising. I think it's it's 
surpass TV, even though there's still, I think, a lot of um, companies and brands still trying to get on the bandwagon. I think there's a lot of um, challenges in learning a whole new space that they, they just aren't familiar with. And, and it operates in such a unique way compared to some um, previous uh, um, forms of advertising, especially with TV and things like that. Um, and I, I just think that there's a lot to learn and educate, um, but I think that's the biggest misconception that at least I had or I've, have, I've heard in, in working with a lot of clients. And, and so it's trying to get people on board with something that is, is truly significant and um, really a champion in the advertising world. Um, to kind of build on that, I think another, at least from what I've seen and or what I understood before all of my time in Empower um, is that there really is a pretty clear distinction in organic social media versus the paid side of social. So I think when I say that I work in social media, people automatically assume that I'm really creative and work in the content side. And that's not the case at all. Um, it's just like any other marketing like channel um, or tactic from a strategy perspective where we're still, you know, um, strategizing and working towards revenue goals and held to those same kind of KPIs as any other digital or traditional uh, marketing tactics. So it's not just looking for something or creating something that looks nice on Instagram and an ad. It's a lot of the back end granularity and looking at reporting and stuff too. A hundred percent. I would say also, I mean, it will go back to what, um, Brian was saying with you have this perception of, oh, you must you must work with influencers. Oh, you must just create these beautiful things to support your platform. Um, but it's a lot more project management and a lot more strategy um, than I think a lot of people realize. Um, and then also as a person that kind of is the traffic light for what's going to go and what's going to not go on your platform is that you have to be truly the specialist of what um, what type of content even belongs there because you'll get pushed back from a person that says, oh, we were doing this thing, so it, it must go on there. This must be the best place to put it because people are on social. That's not always the case. Um, and so really being the advocate for your platform and um, managing kind of all those streams of understanding what the best strategic approach is. 100%. I think related to that point about knowing why you're there, um, you know, especially when you're in like a B2B kind of space, um, there are some misconceptions that uh, maybe your business shouldn't even be on social, um, which I mean, throughout my career, I, you know, I've move some organizations there. And I mean, I think everyone on the panel with me would agree that probably there's a place for your business or your brand or your organization on social. Is it everywhere? Like, no, you don't necessarily have to be everywhere. Don't force it. But anymore, um, one of your quickest and easiest, and not easiest, but you know, like one of your most direct ways to reach people is actually through your social media platforms. Um, and then kind of, again, related to what some other people have said, I think, um, there's also just a misconception that social media managers are, you know, marketing managers who do social media, like it's just like it's fluff. Like it's, it's we, we fritter around on our phones and call it work. And I think this whole conversation today is gonna be about how that's just absolutely not the case. And it, you know, the, the strategy and the goals and the KPIs vary from organization to organization, but we're all here because we know how to and have seen how much of a difference um, this platform makes on on organizations and business goals. I feel like you brought you kind of hinted at a really good point to Amy with um, just in terms of like reaching an audience. I feel like one of the like biggest uh, misconceptions that I just thought of was that you know social media is something for young people and only mm -hmm. young people, and it's like you, even even platforms that you would think are young like Snapchat like Snapchat is aging. So if we think about like when Snapchat started, like those are now people who were like new to Snapchat, who basically like made the platform what it was, they're like moms and they're, and they're aging and they're, they're like, it's just one of these things where it's like, people are like, oh, well only like millennials who by the way are not like teenagers anymore. They're all adults, all like aging. 
um, are only on social media. And it's like, no, everybody is on social media in some capacity. And if you aren't like, you're an exception to the rule, like you can reach an audience of all ages, all backgrounds on social media. And that's why it's so important to be there and play there. Kind of going back to your first point of like, this is not something that's on the rise. Like it's here, like you have to have a social media strategy. Absolutely. Like, regardless of who you are. Yeah. Um, awesome. Any other thoughts on misconceptions that come to mind about the work that you all do? I was going to echo the misconception of it being a, a young person's job or a young person's game because I literally, like when I graduated college in 2011 and had experiences professionally around that time and shortly after, like, well, you're young. Why don't you do a Twitter? You know, I was like, um, well, uh, that's like a pretty like honed skill set. Like I knew enough as like, that's a pretty honed skill set. Like, not that I'm not game for it, but you know, and, and it was, you know, the, uh, reality or credibility of it being an actual paid and also organic, but definitely a paid viable strategy for a brand or a company was not in that, in that conversation yet. So now that it is, um, you know, it's definitely much more established as a channel. Yeah, a few years ago, um, and probably still some today, but especially if you like five years ago, at least like social media was like the job that the intern had. Um, and I mean, don't get me wrong, like if you have a social media internship, that's awesome. And you you have it because you have skills. But, you know, there's there's been a running joke kind of in this industry that, you know, oh, like, you know, when you can almost tell when like a brand has just decided that someone should run their social media just because they are like brand new. Um, and to Suzanne's point, you know, absolutely give give, you know, give somebody the chance to learn it. But there's gotta be so much more involved in who has that role because we're gonna talk about this, but I mean, you are so much the voice of your organization um, when, when you are there. So yeah, it just, there was a thing where it's, you know, give, give it to the intern, but there's gotta be more thought into it than just if someone's an intern. Yeah, I totally get that. Especially if everybody's on social media, like you clearly have to have a solid strategy in place because just doing the bare minimum is not, not gonna work. Um, okay, so we're going to jump into some of the questions that have come through. This first one, I mean, is is probably a fairly loaded question, um, and we've already talked a, a little bit about this as you all hopped onto the call. But how has the pandemic influenced your jobs, and what has stayed consistent? Just want to go around the. Yeah. Do you want to, Suzanne, you want to kick us off? I can, yeah, I can kick us off. So, um, so how has the pandemic influence? So it's kind of like, so before the pandemic, I was like chasing all of these events and chasing assets and chasing, 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 you know, just to like get the social media post or get that content, get those assets. And those events are all done away. That was in part nice, but it's also like, okay, um now we need um screenshots of people's virtual meetings and like i mean they're in like late march and early april like every account was just like here's our board meeting you know which was like great like that's fine but like now it's tired you know so it's like okay we still need to like keep like coming up with different you know sources of content and so i mean i can say with me and again, I think this would have happened whether or not um, the coronavirus pandemic, but like something that I always kind of try to have an eye to is like the student generated content. So like for Instagram, like our takeovers, which um, Mara, I see you on here. Thank you for doing that last month um, with your fellow souls. But like, you know, as much as possible, like, sure, we have a cool building and UC's campus is really pretty, but like nothing beats our students faces. So if like you know, just like with some guidelines, with some prep, you know, hey, don't go here, don't go there, that kind of stuff. But like, you know, putting, you know, allowing students to kind of take over and share their experiences, like that is like our product, you know, so to speak. So that we can't beat that. And that would have happened whether or not the pandemic, you know, was here or not. I can go next if no one else. Uh, dying to jump in. Um, so outside of the obvious um, virtual working experience that 
I think everyone's going through right now. Um, I think the pandemic has hit us hardest in the sense that certain clients are seeing completely different results and effects of COVID. So um, one of Empower's clients is Bush's Beans, and they were seeing insane sales, um, insane revenue during the early times of the pandemic because people were stocking up on canned goods, um, which sounds awesome. But then something to be mindful of that we had to watch for was the potential like their busiest season and their highest uh, season was like is summer for Memorial Day cookouts, grill outs, um, all that stuff. So we're kind of like waiting to see the effects of that. Um, Whereas other brands like Ashley Home Store were killed during COVID just because they had to close stores and um, they have a lot of like franchise uh, markets. So they had to close stores. They don't get really a big cut of online e-commerce sales. So kind of shifting strategy and finding ways to suit the needs of different clients who were seeing vastly different results, um, maybe going dark on social for a couple of months altogether, um, while others were really ramping up and kind of shifting strategy towards e-commerce, but still seeing crazy revenues, um, but just having to shift those strategies on, on a dime um, or turn things off and on has been a really big um, effect of COVID. From a consistency standpoint, um, I would say because I'm in the paid side compared to like a content creation um, side, reporting is necessary no matter what. And people want those hot like POVs, like a point of view from our social team as like an area of expertise. So um, whether this isn't necessarily COVID specific, but whether it's whether or not to turn off paid advertising on Facebook for the boycott and what our POV is there or um, from like a Black Lives Matter standpoint, uh, whether or not to go dark for like that Blackout Tuesday, things like that. So kind of the fact that we're still subject matter experts from a social stance, still required to report, stay on top of everything. That doesn't change just because we're working from home or we're experiencing a pandemic. So um, lots of craziness, though. <laughs> Yeah, I I'll totally build on that. I, I I'm also on the paid side. I think what's unique a little bit is that we we do work with influencers and we have those partnerships with influencers to create that content. So um, how we've been affected is you know in working with those influencers, depending on where they're situated in the country, you know, like some of what they're able to do and not able to do is difficult. Um, you know, in store. A lot of times we we have uh, campaigns that will drive to like a coupon that's in store or um, you know certain products in store. I, we have to change a lot of our language around that. Um, but at the same time, you know, retailers and brands are still um, kind of having this like in store promo budgets that I think a lot of them are like, well, we can't really, we don't want to spend our dollars here. We want to shift them over to something else. And in a lot of ways we've benefited from that because they've sit, they've shifted it over to social because it's such an agile, quick solution to um, maybe some dollars that have freed up for them. You know, I think it's almost for like every pro there's some sort of con. So it's like, yeah, as the, as the pandemic, really didn't affect me personally from a working perspective. We already, as a company, have a strong work from home policy. So for us, it was really easy to transition. Um, there was then, okay, well, so how do we work with our influencers where we ship them product and things like that? What does that look like? And um, it's just been very interesting. And we've had a lot of like quick um, last minute adjustments, a lot of turning on and off campaigns, like Ali said, with um, more of the social movements, less of the pandemic stuff. Um, and just being very, I think brands are being very mindful of what their presence is on social and how they're talking about these issues because you know consumers are demanding that they talk about them. Being silent during this time is, is just not acceptable for consumers. And I think that's a huge shift that brands are not used to. Um, and so it's just been, it's just been very interesting. I think a lot of like quick movement, quick change. Um, so you have to be super agile. What I saw at the beginning of all of this, um, especially cause I'm coming, you know, from the, the content and overall messaging, you know, overall marketing messaging side, and then how that translate to social, um, you know, the pandemic hit and we all got locked in our houses. So social media usage skyrocketed, right? I mean, we, we all saw that in different ways. Um, so that that included everything from, you know, from 
like all of my audiences, um, which, you know, for that's one place in my marketing strategy, social media is where I really have pretty equal opportunity across my audiences, whether it's a prospect or whether it's my employees or whether it's my sales team who I support. Um, we're a sales organization. So um, I work with like 40 sales reps. Um, and when the pandemic first hit, I, I, ha I had to set, like, tell everyone like, no, don't, you can't say that. Um, like that, that's not, that's not what you should be saying on social media right now. Um, because to our point earlier for the, um, you know, the uninitiated, um, you, you think that something like this happens and your social media is a great way to possibly exploit something kind of terrible. I mean, something just absolutely terrible that's hitting so many people. Um, so we, we had to go through, a you know, I, everything I was working on for marketing had to be paused. And we had to decide, you know, what what still fits in this context. A lot of it didn't, but what did remain was social, and it really amplified um, how much focus was on everything that I was saying, um, every word I was saying, um, because more people were online to see it, more people were on online to share it. Um, so that was a that was a big effect too. Um, it we didn't change too much in terms of the we. We have a pretty big, um, pretty big portion of the work that I do just being like a scrappy lean team is because um, I'm an in house marketer um, is on the organic side. Um, I mean, we kept our paid social going where it made sense, but just everything had to be reevaluated. Um, you know, at this point, obviously, we're far enough in where I think people have reimagined their strategies um, and it's it's a it's different than what it did look like. Um, but it was just, it was just a matter of like everything you did really need to be evaluated and that hasn't changed with the other things that everyone's talking about have come up in the meantime. Mm -hmm. I can build on that just really briefly. I see a bunch of other really great questions coming in. Um, I would chalk the question up to not how the pandemic has influenced your job. Like we all thought that that was going to be the case in March, but really it's how this year has impacted your job. Um, and so I would say in the beginning, it was that channels were crowded and um, that was due to the fact that companies, I think, were kind of grasping at like, what does connection look like in this time? And how do we be the source that has um, like an answer that helps people feel calm or fulfilled, like whatever it is they're coming online for right now, like they can't get it in person. So they're coming to you. Um, as a digital place to experience that. So kind of being like the first one to have a response um, that helped people, I think was a really big ordeal for businesses who may have not been in the business of doing that previously. Um, and then I would just say now it's kind of almost gone a step past people living online where people really have experienced like digital fatigue. And so now it's a challenge of how do you get people wanting to still engage with you online while they're so fed up of doing things on their computers and on their phones. So um, it's kind of gone full circle. So many good thoughts. And I would, I mean, we have time constraints here, so obviously we can't jump into all of this, but thank you all for for sharing your thoughts about how COVID has impacted all of so dramatically. Um, just to be able to get through some more of these questions, let's go down to Autumn's question. She asks, um, given how quickly social media and social media strategies change, how frequently do you have to alter your marketing strategies to match the new standards? And how does this relate to timelines of more traditional forms of marketing? So if you have thoughts, just feel free to jump in on that. So. Um, first response is daily. <laughs> like, I'm, it's, it's sometimes it's like in one day I'll have so many different changes within a single like campaign, let alone, um, you know, just overall strategies for platforms. So it's, I, and I think all of us hit on this a little bit, just with the previous question, like it is just an ever changing space. And so our strategies change. I mean, even thinking about like TikTok, TikTok was like not a thing months ago. And even I feel like so many of us fought it tooth and nail. We're like, you know, we're not giving in. Gen Z will not bring us to the dark side with this app. But I think everyone's just come full circle with it. And you have parents who are like making videos, thinking it's hilarious. You've got you know, I sit there and scroll and I don't post content, but why wow, is it funny to watch some of these TikToks? It's like the vine of, you know, the Gen Z 
generation. And so we've got advertisers or we've got brands and, and clients like, how do we get on TikTok? And it's like, well, you know, and they're like, well, you guys are the experts. And it's like, I guess we're the experts, but we don't know TikTok. So now we have to educate ourselves on TikTok, then become the experts. Now try to like tell you guys how to do your strategy and your platform. So it's weird because you are, you're the expert, but then you have to make yourself the expert by like testing and, and, and learning things yourself. And so it's very rewarding, but overwhelming. <laughs> um, I think this, oh, sorry. You're fine. Um, I think this is a great question. Um, but kind of going back to what I originally said, depending on the type of social you're working on specifically. Um, so for me, like I said, it's really like a high level like paid side. Um, we, for the most part, depending on the clients might change our planning timelines, but we're mostly planning by the quarter. So we're budgeting by the quarter. We are, um, you know, held accountable to certain goals um, over a certain quarter. So while social, I think specific, specifically like organically um, and from a community management side definitely changes very quickly. Um, your longer term strategy really doesn't. So if you're trying to drive sales or you're trying to drive site traffic or foot, tra whatever, whatever you're trying to, to drive to, whatever your goals are, your KPIs are, those are the same. So um, outside of, I think the craziness of COVID in this summer and the social movements and, um, having to be really quick to turn things off and on, on certain platforms. Um, we're planning pretty much very similarly to any other marketing tactic, I would say. I was gonna actually agree with a lot of that, Ali. Um, I mean, same thing, you know, because, because socials want like one very big thing on my plate, but not the only thing on my plate, um, it would be, it'd be very easy to fall into a rabbit hole of trying to adjust things on a daily basis, but that's just, it's not realistic. And in my particular circumstance is not necessary. So I completely agree that for me, I'm able to, you know, we've, we've got strategies in place. Um, we know what we're trying to achieve. Um, it's social's great because you do have the flexibility to change it up when you need to, or when you want to. Um, but yeah, ultimately, you know, the, the strategy is going to stay, you know, strategy is going to be there and how we achieve it. We have the chance to, to mix it up. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it gives you more room to play and more flexibility and more room to test. For me, that's my big part where I have more room to test than I do if I'm, you know, buying media somewhere or if I'm, you know, if I'm doing um, any kind of traditional campaign and you kind of got to get everything locked in pretty early. And once it's, once it's printed or once, you know, once some, some of those things are set with your other stakeholders, um, you you tend to get pretty locked in. So I like that there's a playfulness and the ability to just try something new. Um, because I think that's how we, um, a lot of us, you know, that's how we learn, um, what the, what the next thing is that we're going to want to switch to. So I appreciate the flexibility, but, um, in my role, especially like I got to be able to fall back on a strategy, especially because, you know, I've got, when we all do, we've got, you know, internal stakeholders who want to know what we're doing all day. So I'm going to jump in and um, move on to the next question, but it sounds like, you know, from what everyone's talking about, there's a lot of agility needed. So, you know, for the students on the call, when you think about some of the soft skills that you might need, the ability to be flexible, to learn new things, learn on the job and, and try new things and be interested in that and creative in that way is really important. But having that framework that hopefully you're getting from your classes and any internships you're doing is also going to be invaluable. So, um, you know, just keep in mind, you can always follow up with any of the panelists um, after this, and we've provided you with their contact information. So, um, one thing that Maya is asking that, that always interests me too, obviously, given uh, my job in career services, but what avenues led you to your, your social media marketing position now? And, and what is your advice for students that are trying to break into the industry? You know, when I graduated from college, um, Facebook was invented like two years before that. So it wasn't even really a field um, back when I was graduating. So, so how did you get here and what advice do you have for students? I can kick off uh, this round of, of, you know, perspectives and answers and it even kind of hints to what Quincy is asking about. Like, I feel like in marketing, there's a little bit of like a tension of like, 
be being a generalist and then being a specialist and neither is worse than the other neither is better than the other it's just kind of you know it just depends on your circumstances your career pathway so you know i mean i would say i'm very much a generalist and that's been informed by just you know the different career circumstances in my life also like my personality like i thrive on variety and things like that and i think that has been like fulfilling and kind of stoking some of that creativity but i don't have like the full pressure of being creative all that often so like you know so like that works for me and so i think um i mean and you you will we'll probably hear different perspectives from everyone but i would say probably like the common thread of what like led me to like getting into social media it's it's writing and asset management like if you can write and you can understand or kind of like hone your versatility of writing um and kind of like understand how that will like play out that's great um and so i think that's been kind of like a common thread and then also just like keeping your assets organized photos graphics whatever your graphic designer is creating all those kinds of things having those pixel dimensions off the top of your head that kind of stuff so i mean i come about it from a very generalist perspective so really curious to hear what other people say um so I've jumped around a bit. I started at a really small agency doing more like grassroots marketing out of school that I interned at um, and then kind of got into like organic social, some content creation um, and like events, the event side of things before uh, getting to empower. And I just kind of realized I wanted to be uh, working more on the paid side with like larger strategies. And um, I think just get into that side in general. So that's just a personal preference and like what you like, what you're interested in and what you're like shooting for career wise. Um, if you're interested in the paid side and working for bigger brands and being kind of on that back end um, from a marketing standpoint, my advice would definitely be to keep a really close pulse on the platforms and how those might work. So while you might not be able to get into like the ads manager for a big brand, obviously, um, Facebook Blueprint is a free tool that Facebook offers. It's educational. There's videos, quizzes. Um, you can learn a lot about how advertisers and marketers work on Facebook and Instagram through Facebook Blueprint. Twitter has their flight school. Um, so those are all completely free. You can get Facebook cert certified, which might cost you a couple hundred dollars, but a great thing to have in your resume if you already know the ins and outs of strategy and ads manager. So um, if that's something that you're interested in, those are some really easy tools to take advantage of and to kind of help you be able to at least speak to some of the strategy or prove that you have some understanding of the paid side without any experience so far. Yeah, um, yeah, that's awesome. I, I feel like my path to social media was kind of like a winding one where I kind of like circled around it at first when with my first co-op at Ology back when they were still a startup. And um, I made a lot of like great relationships at that first um, co-op and tried to stay in touch with a couple of the, uh, you know, as I call them, OG people at the company. And um, for me, I just, I knew that when I graduated, I wanted, um, a slightly different experience outside of digital. And so um, I went into CPG and for me, I just being in Cincinnati, it's such a great opportunity. There's, there's so many opportunities working with big brands here. So I knew I wanted that as like a foundation for myself. Um, that world is very different than kind of what I was looking for from a culture perspective. So I think one of actually, and it was in talking back in the day at, at Lindner with career services, um, one of the best questions that I got asked to kind of reflect on was, okay, so you say you're always interested in creative spaces and that kind of stuff. So are you actually interested in creating or are you interested in just being in a creative environment? And I think that was one of the best questions that I could ask myself or at least think on. And um, what I concluded was while I am a creative Pers like person in my personal life and I enjoy doing creative things. I don't like that from a job perspective. What I do enjoy is being around a creative environment and 
Um, although, you know, we're not, we do have content. Um, we do have like designers and stuff in at my company and at, at the agency, but um, I'm on the paid side as well. So what I'm doing is very like data driven, um, budget driven um, work with more numbers now than I feel like I did when I was working in branding. Um, but it's all like interesting stuff. There's lots of insights to gather from that. And I think for me that it kind of scratches that creative itch a little bit, as well as you know the people that I'm working with, the, the office that I'm in is very creative, very fun. And, and it just makes the experience of doing work more enjoyable for me. So that's kind of, you know, I found my way back to Ahology um, through my CPG role because we were a client of Ahology's and got connected with some of my old pals that, and my boss had a team and she was like, hey, come on back if you want. I've got a team for you to be on. So um, yeah, I, I think it's it's understanding there's a difference there. There's the content side, there's the paid side, there's so many different avenues you can go in with social media. I think it's a great point to, um, you know, this this thing about like fo follow what you follow what you love and what makes you happy, even even if you even if you don't know what the destination is, because you might be surprised by like what happens along the way. Um, so, my my volunteer role um, on the board of directors for the AMA, uh, I ended up doing that because I was at an AMA event. Um, for my own like professional brand, I was like personal professional brand. I was live tweeting, and um, the AMA noticed. And within six months, um, I was the VP of marketing communications, essentially. Um, so it was just I was doing something that um, I enjoyed. I was doing something that I felt like would would build up um, just my my own kind of professional path and it just like opened a door that I wouldn't have expected. And um, that leadership role has like totally changed the trajectory of my career. Um, so just like, you might not always know what the destination is, but like definitely explore things, like lean into things that make you happy and when in doubt, just get hands on and see, see what happens from there. Um, I'm very much like Suzanne, um, kind of in my day job where um, I, uh, I'm a writer and my first, um, the job, um, one of my first jobs was just everything communications got dumped on my, on my desk, whether I wanted it or not. Um, and since then I've been cultivating a career where uh, I do that kind of thing, but strategically and on purpose. Um, so for me, it's a, it's a, one of my skills is being able to really hone a brand voice and know that I've got to do that, um, across every platform, no matter, no matter what time of day it is or what, you know, no, it's, it's got to all seem consistent. Um, but I would just say, you know, like experiment, test things out. Um, you know, the, the different kind of certifications you can get, if something really clicks with you, that's awesome. Um, HubSpot's got a social media marketing uh, like course that you can take that's just like really pretty high level um, shows you all the different sides of it. Like don't be like this is a space where like you can get your hands a little dirty and just like see what you love. Mm -hmm. I would echo all of those things, um, but I think some I remember who said it now. But I think when you're determining like what path you want to go down, what I've personally um, have experiences that it really boils down to a lot less about what my role looks like, but it's about the people that I'm doing it with. And that's just my experience. Like I'm saying, some people might say, no, I want to work in social media. Um, and there's obviously ways you can get that experience through internships or whatever it looks like. You start as a generalist, you become specialized, then you learn paid. Like you don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to know everything, um, but those relationships and things are super important. Um, I would say like the transition of what what type of business you want to be in is really interesting too. like I was a what I would consider a general generalist and I was responsible for social media, but that was not something they identified as a strategy. So it's just something that they were doing because they thought they had to. Um, but then that's very different than understanding that you're going into a role because your company is de determined that this is something that they believe is going to grow their organization. So asking questions like that before you get in the position and find out like, 
oh, I'm doing this and 12 other things, and they don't actually care about social, but that's why I actually came here to learn. So just kind of like making those cultural assessments um, and making it clear in the interview process, like what you're hoping to achieve and making sure those things align. Awesome. So many good ideas from all of you about what specific things students can be doing right now to increase their skill set and to make themselves more marketable for, um, you know, a position in social media. So thank you all for your insight on that. Carly just shared some other resources in the chat. So feel free to check those out as well. Um, but thank you all for your insight on that. Let's go ahead and jump to um, Quincy's question about um, would you say that companies are looking more into in-house or external content creators, photographers, videographers um, during these times? Or would you say there's, a, there's even more demand for consumer generated stories and content? Who wants to jump in on that one? I feel like there's so many different answers depending on who you're working Where for. you're working. You're asking, um, you know, I, Again, I, I think where my company is kind of like put their flag is is working with influencer content. So, you know, we feel that influencer content is more likely to be um, natural on uh, different social media platforms. And so, for us, you know, and we don't we don't even work with very what we call macro influencers. We work with micro influencers. So it's people that we feel have more of a um, genuine connection with their followers and um, probably have a more realistic, like a more real um, follower count than some of these macro influencers that might have different bots or, or other people following them. Um, so we're, we're somewhat niche in that perspective, but I, I guess, again, like it really just depends. There are times where we even um, will take content that's produced by a brand um, or brand assets and try to leverage those um, for different campaigns. Um, I think in terms of maybe specifically what you're asking from like a video videographer, photographer perspective, I'm sure you'll see that, you know, client to client, company to company. Some some companies think that they really want that in-house and they'll have, you know, big design um, department and, and, and that kind of stuff. Where I came from working at a CPG, we kind of, gutted our creative department prior to me leaving. So uh, I, I can't speak for all of, you know, clients and not being in the CPG world anymore, at least for me. Um, I don't know how they're moving. I think that from a social perspective, unless they're making big leaps to do a lot of hiring of social media experts, um, I think that right now it's still some some of it still feels like uncharted territory, so they are leaning to some of these agencies that specialize in those things. Um, but again, I think it, I think it varies, and, and you can find different approaches from different companies. Um, I think it kind of depends on what your goal is from a career perspective, a little bit, um, and also just like depending on like the like what you're hoping to achieve, what companies might be looking for, if that makes sense. So like at Empower, we have a creative team that does our in-house um, creative for some of the clients that we do do the creative for. So like for Tri Health, um, we do all of their creative. Um, so they make that. But then obviously like a lot of brands also work like with influencers, um, kind of like Courtney was saying. So um, depending on what their strategy is overall and what their um, – some of their audiences might be looking for or what like a specific campaign or if it's a product launch or whatever it may be, uh, we're often using both. So um, like for the body shop, which is um, a uh, like beauty brand for those of you who don't know, they have a new big product launch in the fall. And so we're utilizing a lot of influencer strategy as well and looking for that like user generated content to boost, um, put some paid dollars behind. But then you still have um, bigger brands like Ashley Home Store who might do some influencer stuff, but is really just using their bigger like um, brand content and stock photos, if you will. So it just kind of depends on, I think, what a brand's looking for and then in turn how that agency or company or whoever uses content and to look what scale they're doing social media. I think it's never going to hurt. 
um, for you, you know, if you're looking for like kind of skills and things you can practice with, like it's never going to hurt for you as you start to explore what what part of the space you're interested in to um, learn how to take a kind of quick and dirty phone video that can end up going onto social media um, for for a for a business. You know, obviously the the videos we take personally, like you know, there's. Um, there's a little bit of a difference between what, you know, you would do in your own time and what you want to do for a business, um, you know, for a professional role. Although I will say that, like, um, you know, at least kind of in my world, you know, there's, there's really, and it's, it's for everybody, but this translates differently. There's really a move toward like authenticity, um, right now, especially kind of, you know, we, you know, we just mentioned like stock photos. Um, I actually like this year was able to get, um, get a uh, budget for like professional photography, but of my, of my team and of my space so that we can still have our kind of brand look and our polished look, but it's with our people um, for the most part, instead of like stock photos. Um, so it just kind of depends on where, where you are. If right now, you know, video is the only way that you can communicate with your audience um, and you can, you can pull something together on your own um that's going to be a huge advantage for you um but you know it's it's kind of what however you guys need to achieve those those goals but i agree it's going to really depend but it's never going to hurt for you to be able to uh create some social media graphics in canva um you know all that kind of good stuff and have a scrappy backup plan um in case you end up somewhere where you don't have the budget or the opportunity to um go a different route I kind of golden triangle is like authenticity, you know, does it reflect our brand student centered or, you know, to apply that elsewhere, like product centered, service centered, whatever, and then like polished and like very rarely am I able to get all three of those at the same time. So if I'm going to like definitely have one, I'd rather it be like the student centered or about the students and authentic. So, but. But yeah, I mean, I think there's a large, like for creatives right now, I mean, there's the pandemic and then there's like, everyone is having kind of their day of reckoning about fair treatment of creatives um, and also ensuring that creative teams are reflective um, of the demographics of a product or service or intended product or service. And I mean, everyone's having a, a day of reckoning there and um, it'll be unfolding, but I mean, I would say, um, Quincy for asking that question and I recognize you from following you on social media. So, Hey, um, I mean, you know, hone the hone your craft. Like if you have an interest in photography and, and growing that, do that for you. Even if, it, if that's just for you, that's a great gift that you can give to yourself as a creator and putting your energy towards that. And like, if you end up being able to get some work out of it or some contract work out of it, I mean, even better. Um, but I mean, it's, it's a total toss up depending on the circumstances, the company, there's always a wave of hiring in-house and then firing everyone or laying everyone off and then hiring agencies and then firing the agencies and hiring in-house. So, I mean, it's always like a, a cyclical on off cycle. I know we're almost at time, but a really quick build on what Suzanne was just saying um, is that if that is your passion and like the like, photograph, like photographing or videography side is really what you're interested in, building your own portfolio and being your own advocate and building your own like kind of personal brand on Instagram, whether you get like a huge following or not, I think goes a long way. Um, someone on our social team in college, he like loves Key West or something. And so he like built this, made this Instagram originally as kind of a joke, but just for himself for Key West. And he ended up getting a free honeymoon out of it because he built a huge following for from Key West, Florida. And that was just something, a talking point for him when he got hired at Empower. Um, not necessarily relevant, but like cool and something to say. So, um, you know, just making sure if that's really what your interest is, like do it for yourself anyways, because you never know like what will happen. Okay, so we have five minutes left. And so I want to make sure we're, you know, using these next five minutes wisely. I'm curious to know, just rapid fire, if you, let's pretend all of you are a hiring manager for either an internship or a full time job in social media. Uh, what are quick, like one to two things you have to see on a student's resume if you're hiring for, let's say, 
either your position or the, a position beneath you. Some things that you like just have to see on their resume. Resourceful. Okay. And being able to produce like high, high production. I was going to say resourceful as well. And then I was just going to say like a, um, practical way that you have built people skills or leadership skills, just your general professionalism. Yeah, I would say some sort of like problem solving, like you're in a situation that was going one way. Rug got pulled and you found a way to, to figure out a different solution. Yeah, problem solving skills, leadership skills. Those are all things that are great. It's not going to be like 1 specific. Um, job or, or anything like that. I need to see that you can like take initiative and like like on your own projects um, and not have everything handed to you because this is not a space where like everything is just like being like you're just being told what to do and you're 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 just the one maybe making it live or something like you you really got to own um, work your strategy and your deliverables and making things live. Yeah, I was going to say this very similar thing, Amy. Just being self sufficient, um, proving that you know how to move quickly, um, don't need your hand held necessarily, especially in a social space where things are changing quickly um, and everything is mostly a quick Google away. So kind of just proving that you're staying current um, on topics that are pertinent to social media, maybe um, paying attention to like what certain brands are doing that you like so that you can even speak to those or whatever, um, I think it's important. I also say uh, tech savvy or at least a willingness to learn. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of this you can learn. Like, like if it's 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 a, it's harder to break into if you come without any kind of like digital prowess at all. Um, that's where like an internship can be really awesome because you can you can build that. But that's also where we really I would really recommend um, just doing some of that on your own, whether it's the kind of portfolio stuff or. But you got to have some digital prowess coming in. Awesome. Okay, we are just about at time and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So thank you all so, so much for all of your insight. This was incredibly helpful. I know for the students on this call, this was helpful for Carly and me as well to, to get a glimpse into your world. Um, students on the call, I do want to make you all aware of, you know, we a few of you, a few of the panelists mentioned things like um, Facebook Blueprint, Twitter Flight School, Ads Manager. Um, I think Amy, you recommend or, or you mentioned HubSpot. Um, UC also has a subscription through Coursera, which is another great platform to get some of these skills developed as well. Carly also shared another link. We'll follow up with you guys with some of this stuff, but just wanted to make sure that you're aware of all of these things that you can be doing in your spare time to develop your skill set so that you are marketable for internships in the field. Um, we will follow up with uh, the panelists information as well. So I would encourage you all, I guess I'm volunteering you all, but um, I think for the most part, our panelists love to have conversations with students. So if there was a question that you had that was not addressed, definitely encourage you to follow up individually with whoever you think might be able to address that um, question the best. So um, again, thank you all for your time. We really, really appreciate all of the insight that you had to share. This was such a valuable hour. Um, so thank you and I hope that you all have a wonderful day. Carly, any last things to add that I'm forgetting? I do, uh, not necessarily that you are forgetting, but I just, um... I love the time that we spent here because what this continues to affirm to me is that if you're curious about something and you're interested in it, the more you engage in things like this, where you're talking to people doing the job, the easier it's going to be for you to talk about it in an interview, in a networking event, like randomly in an elevator, because I met someone at Empower in an elevator when I was in OTR, and then we had coffee, like these, th these things happen, so just stay uh, stay curious, um, follow their companies, show them that you care, and that's going to like give you dividends back that you might not even realize now. And if you're not feeling into it, it might not be, you know, the right field for you. So maybe you end up in uh, consumer packaged goods, which we'll also have a panel about. So stay tuned for our <laughs> other marketing panels that we're going to have, because we're going to be connecting you with um, great people doing this work um, and 
and we're going to try to focus on UC alumni to, to connect you with people who want to have those conversations. Um, so the last thing really is just, you know, follow us on our social media. Brian runs our Instagram and we're always talking about like, what can we, what can we do on our Instagram? How do we get students to engage? So we're, we're always open to suggestions from panelists or our students um, on how we can continue to share information and get students engaged. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to the panelists. And I hope you all uh, don't stop the conversation here. Thank you. Thank Thanks you all so much. Us. Thanks everyone. Fun. See you guys. Yeah.